And welcome to each one. Glad to have each one here this morning. In case you all are wondering, um, Linda and Victoria do still attend church here. <laughs> I think this is the fourth Sunday that uh, at least Linda has been missing from uh, sickness and everything. And last Sunday, Victoria was tight. We thought she was getting sick, and now she's actually getting the cold. So anyway, hopefully sometime they can be back at, at church again. Um, Brian, if I would come down... Get it off, wipe it off your face. What would you think at least, or maybe tell me even? What about you, John? Would you tell me anything if I told you you got something on your face right, right there? I can see it. My glasses? Huh. It is on my glasses. part of my personal devotions and it just a uh, few phrases here struck stood out to me and um, have kind of been on my mind ever since and I'm not quite sure why except that uh, I just I decided to make it a sermon and to think through some of this so starting in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 7 maybe just to give a little bit of context before I start reading is um, this is the Sermon on the Mount this is soon after Jesus started his ministry and he had I think by this time he had all of his disciples, or almost all of them, and he gathered them around him and he spoke, starting in verse, if you would start in chapter 5, all the way to the end of chapter 7, we have the Sermon on the Mount. That's the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's uh, where he was, I look at it as he was talking to his disciples and then the crowd was listening in. That's kind of how I see it, but maybe he was actually preaching to the crowds, I'm not sure. But it seems like it was kind of a gathering where he was preaching to his disciples and the crowd was listening in. But either way, this was called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's, it's basically kingdom values. It's what Jesus values in kingdom followers. And he was basically laying down part of the principles of the kingdom of what he's looking for in his followers. So starting um, chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Judge not, that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see more clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Turn also over to Luke chapter 6. This is a companion script scripture. I think it's just a different version of the same sermon. Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 37. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over. Shall man give into your bosom? For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but every one that is perfect shall be as his master. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? But perceivest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine, in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine eye, out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. 
This is a, a principle on our, our relationships, how we relate to one another. But I think what Jesus is saying here is that we, we suffer from a problem here of, of finding faults in others without seeing our own faults. Finding faults in others without seeing our own faults. And I think it's a problem that we all face sometimes. Maybe some more than others, but I think it's the problem that we all sometimes struggle with somewhat in some ways. And, you know, just as, you know, when there's dirt on your glasses and you put them on, you see dirt. You, you think someone has something on their face or on their clothes or, and as soon as you clean your glasses, I'm amazed sometimes how quick these glasses get dirty. I don't wear them that often, usually at night. But sometimes I'll take them and I'll just go like this here and I'm, wow, they, how do they get so dirty? I can't figure out how they get so dirty. Have you ever done that with your life? When you stop and you, you're like, how did I get that? Um, where did that come from? Or How did it get so dirty? Now I'm not saying that we're just, that all of a sudden you see a bunch of sins and everything, but I mean more sometimes our our mindset on a certain thing. Or maybe we're having trouble loving someone else and we sometimes realize, oh, I've got some dirt in my own life that needs to be cleaned up. And the other thing is sometimes when we actually clean up our own glasses or clean up our life, the dirt's gone. You don't actually see it anymore. That's happened to me before already where I, I've really struggled where, where I might have, I mean, various times in my life I've had my struggles with people. And there's been times already where I've just really had a struggle with someone. And I just can find all kinds of things to point out in their life. Oh, they're doing that. And why are they doing that? And why are they doing that? And then somewhere along the line I'm either convicted or someone, often my wife, says something to me about, what are, you do, what are you doing about this? And I start realizing the, maybe the, the bitterness or the resentment or something like that. And when I take care of that, the other issues are kind of gone. They're not as big as they were, as I thought they were. Looking at ourselves before pointing out the faults of others, I think we all have a problem of having beams in our eyes. That word I has to do with the, the kind of the faculty of the mind or, or what you take in, your understanding. That's what that word I means, has to, says, or has the connotation. Um, and then also, I found it interesting that it talks about a moat and a beam. That word moat has to do with a twig or a piece of chaff. And a beam has to do more with a beam, like a piece of timber or a, piece of, a, a large piece of wood. So isn't that interesting? Often when we see things in someone else's life that we struggle with, that thing looks huge to us. They've really got a huge problem. But often their problem is more chaff, a piece of dirt, and ours is more the big stick. Isn't that fascinating how that is? And it's, it's, I think it's something we need to be aware of in our relationships. Now, I feel very accepted here. I don't feel like this is a big problem where I think we're really accusing each other. But I think it's something that can come up. I think we all have relationship struggles sometimes. Um, sometimes we, things come up or, or we don't understand someone else's point of view always. And um, you might have heard the saying, don't ever um, judge a person until you walk in their shoes for three days. There is that side where I think it's good to try to understand a person's viewpoint and understand where they come from. But this here is talking more about looking at my own life and the faults that I have, and, and taking stock of my own sins. I want to be clear here. There is a time for approaching someone, and I want to get into that a little bit towards the end, but there is a time for approaching someone and, and maybe rebuking or being honest with them. Relationships need honesty. I'm one who struggles to be honest. Even in my marriage, I can struggle to be honest. And so if my wife happens to hurt me with a comment or something, rather than just saying, that kind of hurt, I'll sit on it, and then I'll sit on it, and then I'll sit on it, and then it gets kind of like gangrene. It starts getting a little infected, and all of a sudden, I can find a bunch of things wrong with her. And it's happened. 
And then when I finally just like, okay, this is what, this is what I'm struggling with really. I actually have more resentment. Then all of a sudden, things can get talked out and you can work things out. Now there's a, there's a nice honesty, there's a gentleness, there's a kindness. Um, and so, and I want to, again, get more into that a little bit towards the end. But, so there is a place. I'm not saying we never, you know, just never say anything. But I think there's also where Jesus commanded us to love, our, love each other. The true mark of a brotherhood is loving each other. And that is also accepting our faults or accepting our, the things about each other. Um, you know, as a southerner, I have to accept you northerners. It's just hard sometimes. <laughs> just kidding. It's not quite that bad. But... Um, there are, there are just things that we have to accept about each other. And I think um, having a good view of ourselves will help us to do that. Having a good view of ourselves. So what are some of the beams or some of those sticks that might be in our lives? Well, I think one of the first big ones is pride. Um, just having an egotistical mindset or thinking that I am, am better. It's, I, I just, I'm, I'm more superior. I know better than you. Um, if you would just see things the way I see it, then things would be better off. Um, there's that. There's also something that I have found in my own life is that when I can't accept my own struggles, I have a hard time accepting yours. And if you cannot forgive yourself, you will have a hard time forgiving your friends or your brother or sister. I, I, find, I don't know why that is quite, but there is something about that as soon as you can accept that I'm broken, or that you are broken. As soon as you can accept that, and accept that I have struggles. Um, one thing I hate about myself sometimes is my, I don't like conflict. I want to just have things, everything peaceful and calm, and, and just, and so, and I don't like that. I wish I would be more okay with, and I'm, I'm learning. I think I'm learning. But sometimes I found if I can't accept that or other things about myself, I'm going to struggle with the next person that also struggles with conflict. Just, or that struggles to accept conflict. Often that happens. Again, not always, but a lot of times when we cannot accept our own struggles or you have to measure up. Um, you never heard your dad say good job. And so you're always trying to measure up. You can't accept that. You can't grapple with that. You're going to have some hard problems with some other people sometimes because you cannot accept and deal and grapple with that. So we have to accept our own brokenness. We have to accept our own struggles. Something else that can be a fault in our life is envy and jealousy. Envy and jealousy. Maybe uh, someone is building a brand new house and they're, they're doing with all the bells and whistles. They're spending a lot of money. And it's easy for us, you know, it's easy to be like, wow, they're spending a lot of money. That's... Wow, I, I would never spend that. Is, is that right to spend that much money on your house? Hmm. Now, maybe there's a place for that. But anyway, I think sometimes our envy and jealousy can cause us to have problems with other people. I wish I could do what they could do. Or I would never do that. That's, that's almost wrong. But really, do you just wish you could do it? Envy and jeal jealousy causes us to point things out sometimes. And again... Who has the chaff in their eyes and who has the beam? Grudges, bitterness, all those things can point out, can, can cause us to want to uh, find those faults in others' lives. Um, if you're having a struggle, as I, or I, I already mentioned about how I am sometimes, and, but if you, if you have bitterness, if you have a, a, are holding a grudge against someone, it, you can find so many things wrong with them, it doesn't matter what it is. Sometimes it seems like there's everything's wrong with them. Goodness. And then you get it taken care of and all of a sudden everything's right with them. It's, it can, that, that's another fault or another thing, a timber that can be in our eye. And then along with uh, accepting our own faults is if when we give ourselves grace, it's easier to give grace to others. I want to look just, just to clarify a few things. Look at a little bit at the beginning of chapter 7 of Matthew. It says, Judge not that ye be not judged. So judging, uh, I want to be clear here, it's important to judge. We talk about making good decisions. It's important to make wise choices in your life. Your choices 
will dictate where you go in your life. But did you know that before you make a choice, you actually judge? Before you make a choice, you actually decide or, or you, you make a judgment call on what you think is good or bad. Um, maybe, there's, maybe there was someone in your life that made a big mistake and you decide, I don't want to make that mistake either. You, you're judging, you're making a judgment call and you're saying, I'm going to be careful. I want to make a decision that I don't do that same thing. That is, that is wise. That is good. Making a judgment. Or sometimes if someone actually falls into sin and making, making that decision that someone is actually transgressing. Or, or maybe you see someone who is, maybe one of your friends is taking a road they should not take in their life. Maybe they're, they're heading down a, a wrong path. There's a judgment call there that, that you should make to help that person. But what the judging that it's saying here is, is not that. It's more that condescending or that wrongfully like, you are wrong. I'm better than you. You should do what I do or you should, you should straighten up. You, that's that, that judgmental attitude and... Um, I have been that way to people, and I have had people be that way to me. I can remember specifically one instance where someone several times came to me earlier, it wasn't up here, came to me and, and tried to tell me some things that I definitely did wrong, that he feels like I did wrong in my leadership. And I never got the feeling like he truly cared. I always got the feeling like, if. You just, for one, I got the feeling like you didn't do it the way I thought you should do it. And second, um, I think I felt this little bit holier-than-thou attitude coming down. It didn't feel good at all. Now, I think we should always hear those people out. I think we should be gracious. But it's way different when it's when someone comes to you with a judgmental attitude and saying, you know, you really should, this is a problem, or you, did, you didn't do this right, versus someone that comes that because they care about me, and they care about where I'm headed, and they care about my leadership, or they care about what's going on, and they truly care. They're doing it more for my benefit than for themselves. And that's something I want you to take with you today. Whenever you approach someone, are you coming to them for yourself or for them? Think about it sometime. If you've ever approached someone, how many times have you went to a person because they were making life a bit difficult for you, and so you did it more for your sake than for their sake, or yeah, more for your sake than for their sake. I've, it's, I have too often done that, where if, if you would just change, you would make life a little easier for me, rather than coming actually and saying, this is a real problem that I, I, I feel like you could find some freedom in, it would help you tremendously. There's a big, big difference how that person will take it as well as your attitude with it. It's important that we never look down on and belittle people. And again, I'm not saying I think this is a problem, but I think it's something we sometimes do in our hearts, maybe without saying anything. And I think it's something that we have to be careful of. It's something that I have to be careful of. Don't get the, please don't get the feeling like I'm I want to be careful I don't come down to you with a holier-than-thou attitude because I'm not. Um, something else that happens. What happens when you put someone down? What happens when you put uh, someone down? You're automatically above them. Putting someone down puts you up. Generally. Which is why it is sometimes so tempting to do that. Especially when when gossip's going around. It's so easy to want to talk and put someone down because it does make you feel a little bit better. It puts you up there a little bit. We, it, it's something I think we need to be careful of. And then also, I found it, um, it's a serious matter because Jesus said, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam that is in thine own eye and then you can see clearly to take the chaff out of your brother's eye, which might never be there anymore. If you, clean, if you take the, the beam, the timber, the piece of wood, 
out of your own eye or out of your own heart, your own life. When we work on our own faults, often the faults of others go away or become smaller. Turn with me to Luke chapter 15, just as a kind of an, another little illustration on this kind of a point. Um, in the story of the prodigal son, there was two sons, and the one came to his father. He said, I think it was the younger son, he said, Father, give me what I get from your inheritance. And so the, the, the father said, okay. So he gave it to him, and the son took off and left and spent all of that, whatever he got, spent it all on filthy living, living it up. Um, I would imagine alcohol and women, and I don't know if they had drugs back then or not, but whatever it was to make him feel good, he spent it all. It says on riotous living. And then when he came to the end of himself, he saw his depravity. He realized he was at the bottom of the bottom of the pit. He said, you know, why don't I go back to my father? I am not worthy to be his son, but at least I can be his servant. And if I can be his servant, I'll at least get fed. And so he did that. He came back, and if, of course, his father saw him a long way off and ran and, and gave him a big hug, put a coat on him and, and said, we're going to celebrate because my son didn't call him a servant. My son has come back. And I love that story for the forgiveness and all the rest of the reconciliation. But the older son is the one I want to look at right now a little bit. So starting in, so as they were having their celebration, um, because the, the younger son had come back, he was back into the family, the older son comes to the house. Starting in Luke 15, verse 25. Now, the, now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, <clears throat> because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, the older brother, he was angry, and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, and thou hast, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. I believe what Jesus was doing here was, I don't know for sure, but I wonder if he was trying to help the Pharisees see their self-righteousness. But I think that's what the older brother had here, was a self-righteous spirit. Look, look what I've done. And why did you do that to my younger brother? Why are you welcoming him back? You, you should do some of those things for me. I've served you all this time. The older brother did not see the fault that was going on in his life. I think, for one, he was maybe a little jealous. But he did not care about his younger brother's restitution and coming back. He did not care. He cared about his own self-righteousness. And therefore, he pointed out the faults of his brother and his father. He was telling his father where he had done wrong or where he thought he had done wrong. I think this is a something that you read about through the New Testament, this thing of lowering ourselves. And that has to do with, again, accepting our faults, looking at our faults, the humility it takes to do that, and then from there is where we can relate to others and help others. And it also helps us to maybe look at them with more of an eye, eyes of grace versus condemningness, condemning, uh, a condemning spirit. So I want to just look a little bit at that, clearing up our vision. How do we clear up our vision by looking inward? And Dathan already read uh, Philippians 2, but I'm just going to turn back there a little bit to look at a few um, things from that scripture. But in Philippians 2, Paul is telling us that we should have the same mind that Jesus had. Starting in verse 3 of Philippians chapter 2, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, 
trying to glorify yourself, trying to put yourself up there. But in lowliness of mind, let, let each esteem others better or other better than themselves. This does not mean trashing yourself. But again, I think it's having that understanding and realization that me and you are equals. Yes, you might have made some mistakes that I haven't made or I've made some mistakes that you haven't made. Um, I think it's clear that in the scriptures that you know there are rich people, there are poor people. There are people that are sometimes living in more victory. There are people who are living maybe sometimes in more struggle. There are people with more hurts maybe than others sometimes. There, there is that. But we are all equal in God's eyes. We all have been created by him. We all have needed him. And we all continue to need him. And just because maybe, maybe you're more successful in business than another person or you maybe have done this or that does not put you on a higher level or a higher playing field, it's, it, we're still equal. And I think that's what that means, having a lowliness of mind. Keep yourself in the right place. You know, I work with people sometimes who are of a higher class. Right now we're doing, we're finishing up a, a kitchen, um, actually kind of two kitchens maybe that are for more higher class. But overall, sometimes the higher class people I work with, sometimes I get almost nervous. I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared I'm going to disappoint them. Um, they have enough money, they could kind of do what they want. And it, it kind of scares me. But why does that scare me? I don't have to prove anything to them. I want to be professional. I want to do what's best. I want to help them out with their kitchens and do give them what they want. But whoever put them on that higher class, it was me. Now, they do have likely more money than I do, and I, I think they know more people in higher status than I know and things like that. But... That does not put them in God's eyes where any different than me. And sometimes it's just good for me to have to stop and think, you know, this is, I, I don't need to worry about that. I don't need to try to treat them differently because I think they're of a higher class. Um, that's, in God's eyes, we are all the same. We are all the same. In Romans 12, verse 3, it says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, having a sober mind, having a, a um, you know, thinking right about something, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Not to think more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. We've got to take a look at ourselves. And so what do we see? I already said one thing. We are all created by God. The worst criminal, sometimes I do, sometimes it helps me to think, you know, if you read stories about what people do sometimes in the news, the worst criminal was created by God. Did you know that? The worst criminal was created by God? We all have sinned. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. I think we have to keep that in mind. Some of us come from a better, maybe a more godly heritage. I've, I've, my parents taught me about Christ and right, about God. They helped me to develop some disciplines, but I still needed God. I was heading in the, in the wrong place until I asked Jesus into my heart. And you know, today I still continue to struggle with, with brokenness. I still struggle with sin. I still struggle with wanting what I want versus what God wants. And that doesn't make me any different than you or any of you all. It doesn't make me any different. I think we need to keep that in mind. We all need Jesus. The worth that we have is from God and not from ourselves or what others say about us. I've mentioned this before. I, I tend to struggle with people pleasing. And you know, one thing about a people pleaser is he has to always, one, he has to always work hard to get people's approval. And it's real easy when you are trying to please people. Again, you can't accept yourself, especially when you make mistakes because you have to please that person or that person or whoever. And it really can cause problems with your relationships with others sometimes. I think it's important that we realize, again, our own worth our worth comes from God, not from 
what other people say about us. Our worth comes from God. Also, I think we need to ask God how to, how to see the things that are cropping up. Is there envy? Is there jealousy? Is there bitterness? Or am I coming across as a, in a very judgmental attitude? We've got to ask, I think we need to ask God to help us to see those things. Real briefly on the story of the Good Samaritan, I, this morning as I was studying, that story just came to my mind. The Good Samaritan, there was a man that was walking from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves. The thieves came and they, they uh, beat him up and they took all his stuff and they left him half dead. And after a while, here comes a priest. And did the priest, the priest was a religious leader. He was, he was in the church, but did the priest help him? priest did not help him, kept walking. After a while, a Levite came along. A Levite was also a leader, or at least helped out, and he was a religious person in the church, or in the synagogue, or in the temple, whatever. Did, he, did the Levite help him? No, the Levite didn't help him either. And then there was, came the Samaritan. And a Samaritan was, I think they were a Jewish half-breed, if you want to call them that. I think they were part Jewish and part whatever. But they were despised by the Jewish people. The, the Jewish people did not like Samaritans, which I find very fascinating that Jesus brought up a Samaritan in his story. But Jesus, this was Jesus telling the story. I think I forgot to mention that. Jesus was telling the story. But a Samaritan came along, and he helped that man. And he cleaned up his wounds, put him on his donkey, took him to an inn or a place where they could take care of him, and then he paid for, paid for uh, his care, and, and saw to it that the man was, became well again. And Jesus was telling the story in the context of who is my neighbor? Who should we care for? But I want to look at it as, I think we all, I, I think one of the reasons why the priest and the Levite had a hard time stopping is because they did not see themselves in that situation ever. Folks, we all at one time were bleeding, and we were robbed, or if you want to call it that, Satan is, was out for us, or is still out for us, but Jesus came and, and he saved us. I think when we can understand that we were also at a low place, or maybe you're not at right now, but you might be, be at a low place again. We, we, sometimes life continues along some of these times of going up and down sometimes, but we were at a place where we needed help. All of us were. And if you haven't yet, you will be. We were all there. And I think if we can recognize that, that we were there at one time, we're going to be quicker to help people as well rather than condemning them. It is easy for me to condemn someone if I cannot remember that I was at that place. And that's why it's important for us to remember some of those maybe painful experiences sometimes because then we can help others a little bit better when we remember some of those times. But we were all at that place where we needed help. And Jesus came and helped us. And he's asking us to do the same. Are we able to help or are we able to condemn or judge? The last section here is treating one another with kindness and forgiveness. And in Ephesians 4 verse 32 it says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Romans 12, 9 to 10, Let love be without dissimulation, which is um, without hypocrisy or or Make it sincere. Uh, have sincere love. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another. Romans twelve sixteen. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend. Come down to men of low estate. There are those people who are maybe suffering more than others, who do not have some of the things that others we need to identify and help the, those, uh, the lowly, rather than condemning them. And then 1 Peter 1, verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently. I read these verses just to kind of help us get a picture of how we should treat one another with kindness, with tenderness, with forgiveness. How often should we forgive each other? <laughs> What's that? There's no end. Anyone else? How often should we forgive each other? 
Are we supposed to keep count? <laughs> no, we're not supposed to keep count. We are supposed to have a forgiving attitude towards each other, to be gracious and to forgive. I think we are called to love, and part of that is accepting one another in our weaknesses. But I also want to look at now a little bit, what does it mean to, to help others in their, you know, when there is a problem, when there is a real problem? As I said before, there was a time for honesty. When I was at Mountain View Nursing Home, the guy's dorm was a very honest place. There was not much you could hide there. If someone was mad at you, they told you very quickly. And um, there was also a good bit of love there. There was, there was uh, you, you gave and received pretty quickly. But there needs to be a tenderness in our honesty. There needs to be a tenderness. There needs to be a um, gentleness. Before our men's meetings, Dathan always says, we want to be honest, but kind. And I think that's very important that we, we, that we do that. It's important for an organization as well as a relationship that there is some honesty. As I said before, I struggle with honesty sometimes. Not that I try to lie, but I struggle to say how I feel because I, don't wanna, I want the peace to stay where it's at. I don't want to destroy the peace. But then I can harbor resentment because I was not honest and it, it just kind of builds up. And so there is a time, there is a place for honesty in our relationships. But how do we go about doing it? I think loving each other sometimes means we approach someone about something in their life. There is that time we need to do that. Galatians 6, 1-2. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. James 5, 19-20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, help him turn around and come back, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. How do we do this? Did any of you all notice... How, what for spirit are we supposed to have when we restore someone who has erred in meekness? A spirit of meekness, a spirit of humility, of putting someone else, you're actually putting that person ahead of you. I think when we actually approach someone about something that's difficult, now this is my opinion, I think it should actually be difficult. I think it should be hard for me to do that because I care about that person. It should be hard. It should not come easily. When I was, years ago, um, I struggled a lot with someone who was a superior over me. And there was a, there was a time when I decided that I'm gonna show some tough love. And I'm gonna go and approach this person and let this person know how I feel and, and tell them some of their faults. And just kind of lay it there. That's tough love. I care about this person. And so I did. And it didn't end up the way I thought it would. At all. So I was even more mad. Uh, mad. I was very frustrated. There, that's better. Frustrated. And in the course of time after that, I was talking with someone else, a friend of mine, more of a, just a, a peer of mine, and that person asked me how it's going with my relationship with my superior. And I said, it's still just, I'm having, oh. And that, my, my peer just really laid it at my feet. And this person really told me how it is. And, was, and said, do you really love your superior? Do you really care about them? And basically showed, I guess exposed my own timber in my eye. I will never, ever forget this experience. Never. I don't think it was it was I, I can still just remember that feeling leaving that conversation and first of all feeling so actually ticked at that person now because they pointed that out in my life but over the course of a couple days I, I just had a real kind of awakening to my own thoughts and my own my own sin at I was not loving one bit I wanted that person I wanted my superior to change so that I could just things would go better for my life and granted, there were some things that maybe should have changed. I'm not, not taking that away. There were some problems there. 
But at the same time, I did not come in the proper spirit. I did not come in the proper spirit whatsoever. How do we do that? Well, meekness with humility. And as I said, I think it should be a very difficult, I think it should be hard. If you truly care about your friend or your brother, it should be hard. I think we should saturate it with prayer. Now again, as I said before, sometimes honesty happens more spontaneous. I think there's times for that. But at the same, but I, I do think we need to be careful, um, especially when we do a rebuke. It's something that should be taken very carefully. Um, and again, thinking about, is it for me or is it for that person? Do I truly care about where that person's going or is it for me? I think we just need to be willing to always look at ourselves first. To always look at ourselves first. And I hope I, I hope I didn't make it clear. I hope it didn't sound like, you know, I think we should just uh, let people where they're at and have a happy, jolly day. No, there is times for rebuke. There is times for honesty. There's also times for acceptance. And accepting each other's, you know, faults. Accepting our ways of doing things that are different. But I think we need to always keep in mind that we are to be tender-hearted, compassionate, forgiving one another, as Christ also hath forgiven us. Let's kneel for prayer. Thank you, Father, for being with us today again. Thank you for.